So we're doing a Sherlock series through the remainder of this year, four case studies that we are detectives looking into a subject that might be unique to us or a little bit confusing to us. And the first one that we looked at was the mystery of the cross. And we actually took quite a few weeks to look at different angles of what the cross is communicating. Now we're going to start this, the meaning of Pentecost, and you'll see in a moment that when you celebrate uh, the church calendar year, you will find that um, the next thing that comes up in the course of the church calendar year, 50 days after Easter, is called the Feast of Pentecost. So the Feast of Pentecost celebrates the giving of the Spirit, but there's a lot in it that I think is essential for us to understand because there are connections to various parts of the Scripture for us to see. So what we're going to do over the next four weeks, we're going to take four weeks, and this is the subject matter we're going to talk about each week. I'm going to talk today about receiving the Spirit of Peace. Then next week we're going to talk about conceiving of a better world, Number three, believing in the beauty of diversity. And number four, participating in the work of unity. Now you'll see there that that goes much bigger than the episode on the day of Pentecost where a group of people gathered in Jerusalem for the feast of Pentecost began to speak in other tongues. It's a bigger, bigger picture. It's a broader subject. So the key question that we're going to ask is, what is Pentecost? What do we do with it? And why is it important? So the name Pentecost basically means 50th or 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus was the giving of the Spirit. But that's not where it originated. Pentecost was one of the three pilgrimage festivals that the Jewish people traveled to Jerusalem to celebrate every year. So if you will remember with me the story of Israel in the Old Testament, you'll remember that God called a man by the name of Moses, right? He says, go to Pharaoh and say, let what? My people go. And so there's this big, long drama that takes place where there's ten plagues, and finally Pharaoh lets them go. When they leave Egypt, they travel to the Sinai Peninsula. And it is there at the base of Mount Sinai that they camp. And while they are camped, they receive from God through Moses the giving of the law, also called the Torah. That occurs 50 days after they were delivered from Egypt. So it takes them a bit of time to come up out of Egypt, to travel into the Sinai Peninsula, and to encamp at the base of Mount Sinai. So that becomes a commemoration for the people. Every year, they would celebrate the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of God's gracious gift of the giving of the law to His people. Now, when we read the Torah, when we read the law, you know, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, we would get bogged down and say, how do these people live with all these rules, right? But to them, it was very freeing. It, It represented them establishing their own community they be, are becoming God's people. This, uh, these are the boundary markers that will make sure this community is going to thrive and survive. And so the law in the mind of the Jewish people was a gift that was given to the Jewish people. And so on a yearly basis, they would take this pilgrimage and just like Passover, they would celebrate it in appreciation of what God was doing in the life of his people. So initially, the law was to finish the deliverance from Egypt by enabling them to live a new way of life that they were unable to live while they were in Egypt because they were in captivity. Now, God is creating this kind of community that's going to bring them glory God is creating this kind of community that's going to honor one another and help one another and serve one another, respect one another, and so forth. Then what we find taking place is 
this idea of Pentecost as it moves in to the New Testament is still being celebrated on a yearly basis by the Jewish people. And in Acts chapter 2, what we find is the day of Pentecost becomes kind of the birthday of the church because the Spirit is given on a day where God is allowing the people to celebrate the day of Pentecost from the Old Testament, but he is infusing it with new meaning, saying, no, I am going to create a new kind of people that's not just going to be Jewish in their ethnicity. It's going to be comprised of Jews and Gentiles from all over the world, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to enable these people to speak in other languages that they are not able to speak on their own, but it shows the empowerment of the Spirit and the inclusiveness of the Spirit to allow all people to see that you cannot box out certain ethnic groups, you cannot box out certain people simply because they're Gentile. What you are doing is you are accepting the fact that God has opened the gate. He has opened the way for all people to relate to Him. And he does it on the day of Pentecost through the Holy Spirit that had been promised by Jesus in the farewell discourse in John 14 through 16 where he says, if I go away, I will send my spirit and he will be with you and he will be another comforter and he will enable you to do even greater things than you were able to do while I was with you. So the Pentecost moment in the New Testament is that the spirit that was promised is now active. And it's alive in the heart of those that look to Christ and in the world itself. And then this becomes also a yearly commemoration, not just for the Jewish people, but for the early church as well. So I am kind of curious, did any of you grow up um, using, or the church that you might have t attended in the past, using what is called the Christian calendar? Okay, uh, Justin, uh, Clint says yes. So here's what this looks like, okay, if you could put it uh, kind of in a visual form. So in more liturgical churches, not more freestyle churches, but more liturgical churches, it is believed that the church year begins with Advent, we all know what that is. It's the four weeks that lead up to Christmas, and it's a time of anticipation. God is coming into the world through the incarnation. So we celebrate the incarnation at Christmas time. So four weeks before, and then we celebrate Christmas. Then it is said to be the next period of time, the period of Epiphany. Now, the idea of Epiphany is sometimes connected, at least beginning so, through the visit of the Magi from the east, that they were given this revelation that the Christ child had been born and they traveled to worship him. So the next phase is Epiphany and it leads up to what is called Lent. Now Lent begins on Ash Wednesday, 40 days before Easter. And during that time, it's a time of remembering the crucifixion. It's a time of preparing our heart for the ultimate sacrifice of love as displayed on the cross. Once Lent is done, there is the celebration of Easter, and the celebration of Easter is the great victory. He is risen from the dead. Now, right after that, in the church calendar, you see this little thing called Pentecost. There's a thing called um, the common lectionary that sometimes churches use that kind of divide up the year and give scripture passages and other thoughts that relate to the season of the year that you are in. Pentecost, although it is one day, 50 days following the resurrection of Jesus, there is also called the time of Pentecost, the first Sunday of Pentecost, the second Sunday of Pentecost, third Sunday of Pentecost, that type of thing, until you get to the month of June, and this is called ordinary time. Now, this is quite unique here. It is this idea between June and November. Uh, it's just life. It's the life you have. It's the life I have. It's the life we share. 
where we're making a living, we're trying to enjoy life, where there's no special events or holidays that are being recognized. Now, I will say that a little bit tongue-in-cheek because even during this period of time, there are sometimes different days that are held in honor of different saints and that type of thing. But I'm talking about this common experience of the church calendar. You'll notice there's different colors there. There's purple, which is preparation, white at Easter celebrating uh, Jesus and his resurrection, red celebrating Pentecost because it is said that on the day of Pentecost there were these small little pillars of fire that was above the heads of those that were in attendance. We'll come to that, okay? And so color is also an important part of this whole thing. And then green is just this ordinary period of time uh, from Sunday to Sunday where we enjoy the gift of life that God has given to us. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay, so that's kind of what is called the church calendar. And there are many churches that, I mean, they stick really close to it, okay? They are very precise on keeping that. Others, like our own, will hit highlights of it, but then we want to do some other things at times and so forth. So, the imagery of Pentecost is quite interesting. There are several things in this idea of Pentecost. Fire, wind, and breath, and dove. Now, in a moment, I'm going to turn to John chapter 20, where there's this idea of peace be on you. Receive the Holy Spirit. And of course, the symbol that is often used for peace is a dove. Okay, Wind and breath is this idea of a strong wind that occurred on the day of Pentecost being present. And then finally, fire, this symbol, this ancient symbol of the presence of God. So here's what I want to do for today. In the time we have remaining, I will talk a little bit about fire, and then I want to talk a little bit about dove, okay? And then in a, a next message or two, I'll talk a little bit about the idea of wind and breath. So in this understanding of Pentecost, what we find taking place is that the gift of the Holy Spirit is given to Jesus' followers as a fulfillment of promise, number one, as well as the proxy presence of Jesus while he is away from earth. So you can imagine the disciples when they hear that Jesus is going to be killed and then in Acts chapter 1, which we'll look at next week, when Jesus says, I must leave you, and it's called ascension, uh, he leaves behind his disciples. And you can understand that the disciples probably would have been, number one, confused, and number two, a little bit fearful, okay? So they're going to hide in an upper room, and they're just waiting, um, and we're going to talk next week a little bit about waiting for the world to change. That sometimes we hide behind the fears that we have, just hoping and praying that the world will change around us. And that was the disciples. And then what we find is this comes about where in John chapter 20, I'm going to read you this paragraph, very, very short. There is this appearance of Jesus to the disciples. Here's what it says. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, and their, uh, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So there's the paragraph. So Jesus appears and bids the disciples to take a deep breath. And I will call this the deep breath of peace. So they're hiding in an upper room. They're afraid. Jesus appears and says, peace be with you. And then he breathes on them the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, 
The idea of peace is critical to our understanding here. His first words post-resurrection is peace be with you. That's an Old Testament concept. Shalom. We've all heard that, right? The concept of shalom, where things are at peace, when we are able to live without fear and in safety. And so Jesus breathes on them this spirit of peace. And then he does an interesting thing. He shows them his scars. Now, Thomas, in the next paragraph in John chapter 20, says, I will not believe unless I see his scars. He's not present, evidently, in this moment where Jesus breathes on them and gives to them the Holy Spirit because Jesus said, look at my hand, look at my side, right? So he shows them the scars to verify that he is the risen Christ. Now what's fascinating to me in this is as he shows them his scars, he breathes upon them the spirit of peace rather than a spirit of of condemnation, hatred, retaliation. Think about this for a moment. If that was me and the disciples skedaddled and betrayed me, I would be filled with animosity. I would be filled with anger. I would be filled with, how could you do this to me? You wait, I'll show you. You wait, I'll get even with you. You wait, you'll be sorry, right? None of that is in the text. Jesus appears to his disciples and he understands that we're all human and we're all frail and that we all make mistakes and we all have this element in us that sometimes will choose the worst that's in us. And that was true of all the disciples. They all betrayed Jesus. But Jesus appears and says, peace be upon you. Shalom be upon you. And he is granting to them a sense of relief. And if they would just take a deep breath, at least for a moment, if they just go, Jesus offers them a gift they never, ever would have expected. Forgiveness. The ability to have their guilt and their shame removed from their shoulders. Take a deep breath, he says. Peace be upon you. And as they take this deep breath, there's a sense of peace that can come over them. And then he gives them a mission and he says, as the Father has sent me into the world to breathe upon the world the spirit of peace, I am sending you into the world so that you breathe a sense of peace on other people as well. Breathing. It's a funny thing. We all need it. And a lot of times we're often unaware that we're even doing it. Until you make it conscious and you go, take a deep breath. Now you're conscious that you're breathing, right? But do you know that when you take a deep breath, you have to exhale at some point. You can inhale, but if you don't exhale, you're in trouble, right? So... Let's play a little game for a moment. Take a deep breath and hold it. <laughs> now, each of you have a, a different length of time that you can hold your breath. I think Justin still is. <clears throat> but at some point you go, <sighs> why? Because the air within you that provides you oxygen, as you hold your breath, turns to carbon dioxide that is lethal to you. So what happens is when we take a deep breath, if we don't exhale, then we, in a sense, are suffocating ourselves in the process, right? And that's why when a person is being choked, they're actually killing themselves because they can't get rid of the bad air. Learned something this week I never realized. Have any of you ever had episodes with asthma at all? No? 
for a couple of years, several years back, <clears throat> I, was, I was finding it kind of uh, hard to, to breathe. I went to the doctor and gave me an inhaler and stuff. But did you know asthma, it's not so much that you're struggling to breathe, but you are struggling to exhale the poisoned air. I never knew that. It's that, okay, opening up the passageway when you have episodes of asthma is not only to allow you to take in good air, but it's to help you get rid of the bad air, right? What does this have to do with Jesus? When Jesus says, peace be with you, peace be upon you, take a deep breath, feel the peace of God, but don't hold it. Exhale. Exhale. I am sending you into the world as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. In other words, the only way to be balanced in life is what he says in the final verse here where he says, if you forgive, people will be forgiven. If you do not forgive, they will not be. In other words, humanity has a tendency to breathe in certain things and they won't release it. It's held on inside their spirit and as it's held on, it poisons them. It makes them angry. It makes them volatile. All of these type of things. It seems to me that part of the imagery here is receive the Holy Spirit, but as we'll see, in the day of Pentecost it is don't keep the Holy Spirit, you share the Holy Spirit. Take it in and let it out. Take it in, let it out. So in this passage here in John chapter 20, what we are seeing is taking in a deep sense of peace is this idea of what God was doing from the very beginning. He breathes into Adam the breath of life, and then he says there is a sense of forgiveness when you do that. There is a new way to be in the world. Wouldn't it be wonderful that, if ever, that everything wasn't a culture war in our society, taking in a bad breath and holding it? Instead of just letting it go, for heaven's sakes. There are more important things in the world than some of the things that we are arguing about. So this idea of breathing is we are not finished until we exhale and then take in a new breath. And the Spirit of God allows us to take in another breath after another breath after another breath that allows us then to feel the fire of his presence. And the fire of his presence goes all the way back into the Old Testament. The fire of his presence is revealed when we find Moses meeting God for the very first time with a fiery bush, right? The name of that fiery bush in Exodus chapter 3 is called a senna tree, S-E-N-E-H. What does that sound like? Sinai. So they go out, they meet God in the Sinai Peninsula. It's there on the top of the mountain that there is this fire that is burning. And again, the people are afraid. What's going on there? Moses, you've been gone too long. Why haven't you come back down? He comes back down, and with him he carries instructions on how to build a tabernacle, this tent-like structure that would be used for worship. And so the people of Israel, as they travel through the wilderness, they take the tabernacle with them, they set it up, they tear it down, they set it back up. And we're told that at night there was a pillar of fire that would light the tabernacle. See, the theme is continuing here. There's a fire that's continuing to light around the tabernacle. So finally they build a non-portable structure called the temple. And in the temple, there's the holy place and the holy of holies. And we are told that inside the holy place was the glory of God. The idea of the Shekinah glory of God, where this symbol of fire is present when the high priest goes in on the day of atonement to 
intercede on behalf of his people so that they can get a sense of peace and relief for the things of the past year. Then we come to Jesus. And he says, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And when you receive the Holy Spirit, you're going to be my ambassadors in the world. And so they gather in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit comes upon them. And here you have little separate flames of fire that is symbolic, that no longer is the presence of God found only in certain privileged individuals like the priesthood or in one place geographically. But wherever you go, whoever you meet, you will have the opportunity to be able to be the torchbearer of God's love and peace to those around us. Starting to see some of the connections here. Pentecost is not just about this bizarre event where people who don't know an earthly language are speaking an earthly language. We'll talk about that more. But what it is, is this deep sense of peace and relief that is to give to us a blessed assurance. You know, the central message of Pentecost is that the same spirit that filled Jesus to make a difference of peace in the world dwells inside those who choose to follow him. But we must take a deep breath of faith and receive the peace that he is willing to give and not hold it in and allow it to become toxic because Pentecost is pulling us forward to take the peace of Christ and exhale it to those around us. The Spirit is this bridge between the historical life of Jesus and the post-Easter life of the church in the world. The role of the Spirit is to enlighten our minds and hearts to the truth so that deep inner peace can accompany us and allow us to be a beneficial presence to other people. So as we exhale peace into the life of the world, the Spirit empowers us beyond what we can do on our own. The Spirit transcends human ability and transforms human inability. To be open to the Spirit can mean releasing into the world what you've already experienced, a sense of peace because you've opened your spirit to his. Amen. Join me in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will guide us in these moments that we have together to be a sense of your peace in the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.